Fiscal was the library. Yeah, but then I looked in my email and they just, and my appointment is not until tomorrow. Oops. <laughs> so they turned you away? Oh.
Hi, Dr. Alexander, do you hear me okay? Uh, 
Testing, testing, Dr. Alexander, let me know if you're able to hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, <clears throat> that's good news. <clears throat> All right, um, hey, with, with your presentation today, are you planning any kind of videos or anything with audio? Uh, no, we don't need to do audio, but there is a video. Um, if we can, we'll try. Okay. Uh, I've had mixed results over Zoom with it, but I've it the, the presentation will stand on its own without video, but it's kind of nice. Okay, it well, it, it should be doable. We'll, we'll make it work. Now, are you sharing the PowerPoint from your computer? Or is one yeah, you are. yeah okay. I'll do it from my computer. Okay. Now, when you present by Zoom, are you familiar with the little option for uh, share computer sound and optimize for video? Uh, yes, I haven't done it in a while. Okay. So we, we can run through it real quick. If you'll, um, you'll right now go, go and hit share screen there at uh -huh. the bottom. And, and they just stop right there. It'll after you hit share screen, it'll tell the little menu of options that you can mm -hmm. you can share. And you'll see in that white box that down at the bottom, there's a little box you can click for optimize for video sharing, or it says something close to that. Yeah. Um, optimize for video clip. <clears throat> so you want to hit that little box and then share your PowerPoint, and that'll help us to share the video at the appropriate time. Okay, great. And if, if you'd like to pull up your PowerPoint now, we can test, test a couple slides and make sure that they had bounced correctly. There, how's that look? That looks good. Yeah. Um, the video is towards the end. All right, so this is a video. Okay. Does that look pretty smooth? As, as smooth as Zoom tends to do, yeah. yeah. And, and I think I hear a little bit of noise with it. Yeah, there's very soft audio. Okay. It's not, it's not. Can you see his tremor when he tries to write though? That's the real issue. Uh-huh, yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's the real issue to drive home. And then here's the follow-up at the end. So this always gets gaps, gasps in person because it's so dramatic. But I found that Zoom doesn't always allow for that. But well, the, the, this, yeah, the, this is true, and it's going to depend on. I, I know you and I have done this before. I think, I think last time you and I worked in this capacity, you were at home, and your your bandwidth was a little laggy. But it looks like you're at the office today. So maybe yeah, I made sure to come in today. I learned that lesson. I'm not going to repeat it. <laughs> All right, and, and then it somewhat depends on the bandwidth of the of the viewer. Um, yeah, we'll, yeah. So I don't know if we'll get gasps. If if you'd like to send out the the links to YouTube video after the fact, I can certainly accommodate that. Cool. Well, we so we are at um, we're twelve oh one. We better get rolling. So Dr. Rolston is on. Um, there's Dr. Moretti. His name is shown as Dr. Rolston on on the call. We, I, I, know, I, oh, I, I know why. I think because John sent me the invite, I didn't have it this morning. And so I have his invite. That's right. We'll fix that. No, not a problem. Okay, folks, the time is 12.01. So let's go ahead and get started. My name is Jared Price. I'm with the, with the University of Utah Health. And we're here today to talk about movement disorders and focused ultrasound. Uh, we're pleased to hear from Dr. Matt Alexander, Dr. John Ralston, and Dr. Paolo Moretti. And I'll let each of our presenters take a moment as they get started and introduce themselves and um, and their role today and their kind of their qualifications for teaching on this topic. They're going to talk about some innovative and life-changing treatments for that uh, are, are useful for both primary care and specialty providers. And so we're, we're glad you're here. Quickly, uh, before we get started on the teaching, a, a word about CME. Uh, if you're familiar with the University of Utah CME system, you already know this, but for those who are not, the, the CME process is that CME must be claimed the day of the presentation and claimed by midnight. 
So please take a minute uh, at, during this presentation and claim CME. If you look here in the little chat feature here in Zoom, I'm going to post a link. And that link tells you everything you need to know about CME. That's a, that's a complete help guide. But if you're already familiar with the process, mm -hmm. then perhaps all you need to know is that the number is 172180. That's the CME code. So please go there and claim your CME. Okay, with that, um, Dr. Alexander, are you presenting first? Um, It'll be Dr. Moretti first. Yeah, I think okay. Dr. Moretti will go first. Okay, Dr. Moretti, please go ahead. And, and, and you're muted there. Okay, can you guys all hear me? There you go. Okay, and you can see my presentation, right? Not yet. Not yet? Okay, hold on one second. How about now? Okay, perfect. So uh, just as a brief introduction, Paolo Moretti, I'm a neurologist. Uh, I've been at the University of Utah for about three and a half years. Uh, uh, my role is uh, <clears throat> division chief of the Division of Movement Disorders. I see patients at the U and the VA, and uh, I work closely with both John and Matt on basically the neuromodulation programs that we have, especially and including um, focus ultrasound. So I figured today there was probably going to be an audience that was mixed. Uh, I have a few slides, most of them fairly basic, I would say very basic. So for any one of you who know already a lot about essential tremor, this will be very uh, simple. It's meant more as an introduction than anything else. And let me see how I can advance my slides because they don't seem to want to move forward. There, I got it. Okay, so just briefly as a definition, uh, tremor is a generally involuntary rhythmic oscillatory movement of a body part. We identify both physiological and pathological forms of tremor for the purpose of our discussion today. We're really going to talk about pathological tremor, uh, which is usually visible, persistent, uh, and I'm using this slide not because I want you to, uh, or I will go in detail through each one of these boxes, but to give you a sense that there are many forms of tremor. Uh, tremor in a way is a difficult disorder to diagnose because of the <clears throat> similarities from a phenomenology point of view, but there are a variety of different types. Oftentimes, especially in a, a primary care setting, and even in many neurology clinics, the tendency is to identify essential tremor uh, without a, enough understanding of some of the other forms of tremor. So how do we define essential tremor? Uh, our current understanding, or at least what I will present today, is based on a consensus, uh, on consensus work that was done by a panel of movement disorder specialists and published around mid-2018, so about three years ago. And with this uh, publication, essential tremor was defined as isolated tremor of the upper extremities, so bilateral upper extremity tremor. <clears throat> as an arbitrary um, timeline, uh, this group decided that the tremor should be present for at least three years. Um, tremor in the limbs can, does not have to, but can be associated with tremor in other parts of the body, head, voice, lower limbs. And there should be absence of other neurological abnormalities, particularly dystonia, ataxia, or Parkinsonism. So I would say, let's keep this in mind for the next uh, five minutes or so, actually for the next hour, that a patient who presents with a tremor that fits these characteristics may very well have essential tremor, but a patient that does not uh, would have to be evaluated, obviously, much more carefully. And this group defined an entity uh, that was called Essential Tremor Plus, which is essentially essential tremor 
with some additional subtle abnormalities. A good example would be someone who has uh, essential tremor, but also some difficulty with tendon gait as an example. Obviously, someone with uh, uh, characteristics that um, uh, change the diagnosis would have a different entity. So I'm going to go through a few very quick examples, and I will not expect you guys to give me an answer, so I'll ask both questions and give myself the answer, but these would be examples of individuals that may or may not fit the definition we just went through. So let's say 65 year old, gradual onset of right hand tremor, but no tremor on the left. Well, we said essential tremor has to be bilateral. It can be asymmetrical, uh, so both, uh, both sides, but with different severity, but not unilateral. So uh, one thought about this or some thoughts about a patient with this kind of presentation, even though other ideas would also make sense, depending on the specifics would be, someone with Parkinsonism or dystonia. A 50 year old with neck tremor and no limb tremor, uh, this often, uh, and actually in the past, might have been interpreted as a sign of essential tremor. Nowadays, I would say uh, someone who develops neck tremor and has isolated neck tremor definitely uh, would have to be either, either an isolated tremor syndrome or manifestation of cervical dystonia. <clears throat> Similar vignette, but with additional hand tremor. And what's important in this is that the neck tremor precedes the onset of hand tremor. And again, based on what we've discussed earlier, uh, the order of development here would be important. So if the hands start shaking before the neck, uh, we may very well be dealing with a central tremor, although that's not a guarantee. But in this order, we would then generally think about cervical dystonia with uh, a tremor associated with uh, dystonia. Uh, a task-specific tremor, again, makes us think of a task-specific tremor or dystonia. So this would be tremor only present with writing or playing an instrument as an example. Uh, tremor in the legs with balance problems is by and large uh, not uh, making us think of essential tremor initially at least, and uh, orthostatic, orthostatic tremor would be uh, what we think about, and sudden onset of tremor, um, again, not typical of essential tremor. I would tend to think of a functional problem, medication-induced tremors, there's other possibilities. So we've basically gone through with these six little quick uh, vignettes, what are the exclusion criteria of essential tremor? If you see situations such as the ones that are illustrated here, you would not think of a central tremor. And I have just uh, a couple more quick slides. I will not really, I've decided not to talk about medications. Um, there are basic medications that we use in ET, but uh, just bring up results of research studies that um, um, argue for the presence of uh, Purkinje cell cerebellar abnormalities in essential tremor. And so this graph shows with the white, uh, I'm sorry, with the white dots, clear dots, uh, the count of Purkinje cells shown on the y-axis in normal individuals, and in black squares, the counts in individuals with essential tremor, arguing for loss of Purkinje cells in individuals with ET. And these are camera lucida reproductions of uh, Purkinje cell dendritic arborizations. What you see, for example, in C, in the panel C, is the representation of the dendritic arborization of, of a Purkinje cell in a normal individual, and in E, the representation, the reproduction of someone with the central tremor. So a lot more work needs to be done in, in research, clinical research on the pathophysiology of essential tremor, but there are some data that would argue for presence of Purkinje cell abnormalities. And I'll stop right here. Okay, and then <clears throat> Dr. Alexander, are you going next or is it? Uh... It'll be me next, Dr. Okay. Ross. So I'll, let me get my presentation ready and I'll get going. We're ready. And, and while getting that up and ready, 
No, I will say, folks, your, your questions are welcome. You're, uh, you're invited to turn on your microphone and join the conversation. There is also, as we see here, the chat feature. You can use that and type in a question, and we'll make sure the presenters are aware of who can address your questions. All right, so, so thanks for the opportunity to talk today. My uh, name is John Ralston, and I am the Director of Functional Neurosurgery here at the University of Utah. Uh, which means I'm a, a neurosurgeon and I work on diseases that affect the function of what looks to be a normal brain. So, so not things like brain tumors, but things like movement disorders like tremor or Parkinson's, um, some psychiatric disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder or depression, and then things like epilepsy. Um, so today I'll be talking about focused ultrasound and more about specifically, you know, what we're trying to do with it, what kind of outcomes there are, and um, who would be a good patient to refer for focused ultrasound. So here are my disclosures, um, uh, NIH funding, there's a gene therapy company for epilepsy that I consult with, uh, Medtronic that I consult with for um, surgical instruments, and then Axion Biosystems, which makes preclinical devices. So as uh, Dr. Moretti said, essential tremor is one of the most common movement disorders out there. Depending on how you define you know, what a movement disorder is, it's either the third most or the first most common movement disorder, but more common by far than Parkinson's, despite the, the attention we might pay for Parkinson's. Um, again, I won't go over this because uh, Dr. Moretti did, but essential tremor are very common in our patients. Now, up to 5% of people over 60, so one out of 20 people you see in, that are older than 60 will have something like essential tremor. Um, medical management is the first thing we try for essential tremor when it's disabling. There's still only one FDA approved medication for essential tremor, and that's propranolol, which is a beta blocker. Um, but there's a lot of other medications we use, things like primidone, um, which are generally anti-seizure medicines. Um, and they have some efficacy too, pretty good efficacy. However, about 50% of patients don't respond to medication. Um, for those patients that don't respond, that's where I come in as a surgeon. And surgery is the option for these patients that aren't um, satisfactorily treated with medications. What we do for these treatments is pretty much the same in um, no matter which way we do the surgery, but we're always aiming for a little part in the brain called the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus. So everyone has uh, two thalami, one on the left, one on the right. Each one's about the size of an egg. And this is deep in the middle of the brain, kind of in the center. And then we each have two ventral intermediate nuclei, which are these hubs in the thalamus that connect the cerebellum and the motor cortex and premotor cortex. Um, the size of the ventral intermediate nucleus is just a few millimeters. It's the, the size of uh, an Austrian winter pea, which I looked up one day. Um, so a very small little cluster of cells deep in the brain that's a really critical hub uh, connecting the cerebellum, which is involved in kind of automatic motor control and adjustments, and the motor cortex, which is involved in voluntary motor adjustments. So we've known since uh, at least the 1950s that with something like tremor, there's overactivity in this little area in the thalamus, in this hub. And we found that doing anything we can do to stop that overactivity will help the tremor. Um, originally, the way we would do this is either opening the, the brain and actually taking out this tissue. Um, people would disconnect it. They eventually got more refined and started using little probes that would either heat or uh, burn or sometimes freeze this area. And that was kind of the standard, which is creating a, a small stroke there until about the 1990s when deep brain stimulation came along. Uh, deep brain stimulation was first really done by this gentleman. This is uh, Lynn Benabid in 1987 in France, Grenoble. Um, it was uh, studied pretty heavily for both essential tremor and Parkinson's. It became approved first for essential tremor in 1997, and then later in the early 2000s for Parkinson's. So the, the primary um, treatment for this, was the primary disease for this was, uh, and still is essential tremor in many ways. The way it works is there's a, a wire electrode, which you can kind of see here in the middle, that's connected under the skin to a pacemaker, which sits in the chest, very similar to a cardiac pacemaker or a heart pacemaker. Deep brain stimulation for essential tremor works great. Uh, there are many trials that support its efficacy and use. Uh, the tremor improves with deep brain stimulation between somewhere about 50 to 90%. Uh, so everyone that gets this will still have some tremor. Uh, but we can control it very significantly and get them out of that danger zone where it's starting to disable them. 
It works in the, about 90% or more patients. Again, not 100%, but the, the vast majority of patients we do this in, uh, it helps them. Um, and it's durable. So when we start looking up, you know, six years, 10 years, 20 years later, the effects are still there. It does get worse over time. And that's partially uh, because the disease is continuing to get worse. Um, and we all know essential tremor is a progressive disease. Uh, but sometimes there, there's some thought that maybe the treatment itself uh, induces some form of habituation. So they're actually working on these newer systems that are adaptive and only turn on when they're needed to kind of preserve that efficacy longer term. And that's kind of ongoing research. So deep brain stimulation was the, the sort of standard of care from the 90s, late 90s to today, um, until focused ultrasound came around. And focused ultrasound is a, a different way, a non-invasive way of creating lesions like we used to do back in the 60s and 70s. And it uses sound to do this. So sound waves are oscillating waves of pressure. That's what sound is. So you're basically moving air back and forth when you're hearing a sound um, that can also travel through tissue. So when you have a sound wave through tissue, you're basically rapidly vibrating this tissue. And any molecule, when it's put in motion, it creates heat or is heat. So all sound generates a small amount of heat. And actually, if you, if you wanted to kind of do this mathematically, uh, you can actually calculate how long it would take for you to scream at a cup of coffee to heat it up, assuming that it could actually hold on to that heat. It would take a few uh, over a year. But this same sort of uh, process can be used to heat up tissue in the brain. The difficulty is how do you heat up something deep in the brain without it heating up things along the way? Um, so that's uh, one challenge. And the other one is that there's a lot of different um, changes in density in the skull and the brain that can refract the waves of sound you're putting in. Um, so sort of like when you see ripples in the water, these, uh, these change direction depending on how shallow or deep the water is. And that's why we have waves that are always directly uh, uh, parallel to the shore and not coming at weird angles. So they first started to try to overcome this in a few ways. One was that they didn't want to worry about the, the skull. This is back in the 1950s. So they would just take the skull off and directly put the ultrasound in. And the other way is they would use more than one ultrasound transducer to help target things. That way the area under each beam might not be heated up, but the intersection would be. Um, so they've known about this uh, ability to, um, to kind of burn pathological tissue for, for you know, 50, 60 years now, and they were doing it uh, in humans um, a long time ago. The difficulty and the reason it didn't catch on was that need for the craniotomy, um, in which case you might as well do a different surgery. So this is far more invasive than something like deep brain stimulation. And this, is a, this is actually a picture of one of these first patients they did back in the, the late 50s in Iowa. Um, the way we've dealt with this now is uh, using many, many, many more transducers than they did in those original studies. So rather than four, now we're using about 1,024, uh, so far more. Uh, and this allows us to kind of penetrate through things like the skull a little bit easier. We can also uh, adjust for the, the variable thickness of the skull using more sophisticated algorithms. Um, one caveat to that is that really dense, thick skulls work a lot better than uh, kind of mushy skulls. So people with really bad osteoporosis, the, the sound tends to get muffled more as it passes through the bone compared to uh, someone who might have a thicker, uh, firmer bone. It's kind of like if you were to hit a pillow, you don't really hear much noise versus if you hit something metal, you hear a really, that the noise is really well conducted. Um, another caveat is that you can't um, have any air bubbles in the way or else those cause problems. So you actually have to shave a uh, patient's hair completely to get rid of those air bubbles to get the sound through. So this is what the modern system looks like. And Dr. Alexander will talk about this a little more. It's a helmet with this 1,024 ultrasound transducers all pointed to that spot right in the middle of the head. And they're able to heat up the brain hot enough to actually permanently burn it to basically create a controlled stroke. Um, this is kind of the results. And again, Dr. Alexander will go in this more detail, but we track the, the patient's tremor by having them try to do things like draw straight lines or spirals. This is before treatment, and this is after a treatment on the same day, showing uh, you know, improved ability to control. Um, and you can see the, the actual um, you know, small control lesion here on this right MRI compared to beforehand on the left side where you see nothing. So this is that small little lesion we created, very controlled, very precise. The outcomes for this are really excellent. Um, this is from the New England Journal Randomized Control Trial Report that came out in 2016. I'm showing that people not only improved in their tremor scores, but in all the sort of disability scales like eating, drinking, hygiene, these are the things you, you test on the tremor rating scale. 
And this is a, a look at individual patients, how much better they got compared to patients that they put in the scanner and pretended to do the focused ultrasound and didn't. So each line is a patient and how much better or worse they got. You can see the treated ones in blue, all of them got pretty good, a lot better. The sham ones kind of clustered around zero. Um, there are possible side effects or adverse events, but they're pretty predictable. So just posterior to where we target is the ventral cau uh, caudatus of nucleus of the thalamus, the VC nucleus of the thalamus, which does uh, sensation. So if you're too posterior with your lesion, you can cause uh, some numbness or paresthesias. And lateral to where we're targeting is the internal capsule. So damage there could cause weakness or dysarthria. These happen uh, pretty commonly with some swelling after the surgery. So when you cause this lesion, you do cause some, some damage to the brain, that's the point. And that swelling is pretty temporary, but it can cause paresthesias, which happen in a lot of patients. Um, there's some subjective gait disturbance or some you know, impaired balance or ataxia. And then rarely you get weakness or dysarthria. We don't see this too often, but we do see the, the kind of transient imbalance in many of our patients from that swelling. Um, you can also use this for other diseases. So anywhere you want to put a lesion in the brain that's kind of in the middle, uh, you can use the same methodology. So it's um, FDA approved now also for tremor dominant Parkinson's. So not just essential tremor, but tremor dominant Parkinson's. And there was a, a randomized controlled multicenter trial that was published in 2017, uh, which shows similar to results for the, the essential tremor one, same target as well. And the adverse events were maybe a little more common in this one, but no real um, statistically significant differences, but the same sort of idea of paresthesias, uh, more in the face than the fingers and some uh, transient ataxias. People are looking at this for um, other targets for Parkinson's like the subthalamic nucleus or the globus pallidus. And this is all in ongoing clinical trials. There are some open label studies that suggested it'll work and there's more closed uh, uh, label ones that are ongoing. Um, it will work, um, we have no doubt about that, but the question is, would it be any better than something like deep brain stimulation, which is reversible? And that's still uh, ongoing. So kind of a summary of um, the pros and cons of the, the two procedures here. So deep brain stimulation and focused ultrasound are both good for essential tremor and tremor dominant Parkinson's. The pros of deep brain stimulation is that you can treat both sides. Uh, for focused ultrasound, you can only treat one side of the brain, so only a unilateral treatment. So you really have to make sure the patient understands that getting one hand better is good enough or, or useful for them. Uh, deep brain stimulation is also adjustable and reversible. So if you don't like the effects or the side effects of deep brain stimulation, you can turn it off. Uh, focused ultrasound is creating a permanent lesion in the brain, which is not going anywhere. Um, some uh, downsides for DPS is that it's an implanted device, so it is an invasive brain surgery. It's minimally invasive, but it still is a, uh, you know, an incision and a cut through the bone, whereas focused ultrasound doesn't have any of that. So they both have uh, some advantages and disadvantages, and it's not that one truly outweighs the other one in any of these uh, different categories. So it's always a, a very balanced discussion with, uh, amongst our team and the patient to see which one's most appropriate. Um, last part of this is, you know, who would be a good candidate? Um, we're lucky that Medicare actually has pretty strict criteria about who they cover. And there's four different things they look for. Uh, so here are the four Medicare criteria, and it's covered by Medicare in every state in the union. Um, you have to have failed two or more medications. Uh, that's typically propranolol or primidone. So they're, they do not want people to be treated that have never tried a medication, which we agree with. That we think that if you can take a pill rather than have brain surgery, you should take the pill. Um, there's a, you have to have a, a, a moderate tremor, so a two or greater on the tremor rate scales. So this is not for people with very fine, hardly noticeable tremors. This is for real tremors. Um, it has to be disabling too. So there's a, another category in the tremor rate scale for disability, and it has to be a two or greater on one of those subscales. So it has to be not only a noticeable, real, uh, you know, significant amplitude tremor, but also affecting the patient in their hygiene or dressing or writing or doing something to negatively impact the patient's life. If it's not doing that, they don't need surgery. Um, lastly, Medicare wants the, can the patient not to be a candidate for deep brain stimulation. Uh, which means that uh, typically patients that are um, older, so late 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, that are not good candidates for DBS would be great for this, um, or patients that have another condition, so like maybe they're on anticoagulation for a, a heart condition or blood clots previously, that'd be another good candidate for a focused ultrasound. Um, in general, the, the kind of like overall is that you want someone that has a bad tremor that's affecting their life, and they've tried medications and the medications didn't work. 
And then it's our job for, in our team to help the patient understand what the options are so they can make a really well-educated choice about these two different therapies, which we think are both are very effective and both have their place. And with that, I will stop here and I think we'll go on to Dr. Alexander's presentation. Great, thanks Dr. Olson. Jared, were you able, able to make me a host? Oh, it looks like I am. <clears throat> You're good to go. Is that showing up properly? Let me go to full screen. Does that look good there? Looks good. good. Okay, so um, again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Matt Alexander. I'm a neurointerventional radiologist here at the University of Utah. Um, and I partner with Dr. Rolston during the procedure day when we do these MR guided focus ultrasound uh, treatments. So I'm gonna walk through a little bit of um, what the workup entails and then the day of treatment. We'll show some pictures and some video to, to show what this looks like in real life because this really is a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, and then after that, uh, we'll follow up with the Q&A session. Um, so the Neurovive treatment process, Neurovive is the proprietary name from the vendor in SciTech who who developed this focus ultrasound uh, treatment. So you might hear that. We tend to just refer to it as focus ultrasound, um, but you might hear the word Neurovive. So beforehand, as Dr. Rolson mentioned, we have to use imaging to map out how we can uh, target the VIM, the target in the thalamus to, to help achieve these results. So that requires two pieces of information, MRI and CT scanning. So the CT is used um, to know what the bone is going to do and how it's going to distort the, the ultrasounds as they come through the skull uh, so that we can try to get them to converge properly. It also is um, an important step to get the, the CAT scan because uh, we look to see if um, the patient is actually a candidate. There are certain skulls, fortunately a minority, that end up just not being receptive to the ultrasound so we can't sufficiently target it. We'll talk about that a little bit, but um, the, the CAT scan helps us do that before the treatment day so that we can make these decisions in advance. And then in addition, we have the MRI scan, which gets us good anatomic information to know exactly where the thalamus is, where we want to target to try to start de deploying the focus ultrasound to achieve our result. And so we fuse those two together. That's what this page is showing here, actually. Um, the green is the, the dense cal calcium, the, the bone, and then any calcium that's within the brain itself. And then down here on the bottom right, we see a representation of each of those 1,024 ultrasound sources to see if they're going to be able to be utilized to pass through the bone and be focused properly to be able to, uh, to target where we need. And then down here, you see what's called the skull score. This is the important number that we need. That number needs to be greater than 0 0.40 to be able to be a candidate. And again, most of the time patients are um, well above this number, but a handful of patients are not. And so that's helpful to know before we get them on treatment day, uh, you know, we can, we can screen them out uh, before we get to that point and pursue things like DBS if appropriate. So the process itself, that surgery day after we've done all that imaging and they met all the, the members of our team to make sure that uh, focus ultrasound is the best uh, treatment choice for them. We start by shaving the head. Um, as Dr. Rolson mentioned, um, air really likes to scatter ultrasound beams and hair is notorious for trapping air and the hair itself also will scatter those beams. So we have to shave the head and then put you in a, a water bath so that we can converge those, those beams appropriately. We give some preoperative medications, mostly to prevent anything that could lead us awry and, and you know prolong our treatment day. So we give a little bit of moderate sedation to take the edge off. The least comfortable part of the day is getting the stereotactic frame placed. So that's when we give that. We also give some things like steroids because they can swell a little in the brain, um, anti-emetics so that um, we don't have to deal with nausea. Um, and then as the patient is being prepped, we are then you know setting up on that module that I showed the treatment plan itself. Um, we select the VIM based off the MRI, and then we fuse that MRI with the CT and the CT that allows that bone modeling. So this might look similar, but it's actually um, a little different from what I previously showed. This is uh, the brain you see here, the black and white is the MRI, but then overlaid on that is uh, the green, which is the color assigned to the dense structures on the CT scan. So the, the calcium in the bone. And so we 
we use a three-dimensional modeling approach to get these two aligned so that we use the MRI to target right where we need to be in the thalamus, but we use the overlaid bone to model the beam. And that's why we have both of those, those data points. So as after we do that, and we've um, given all the other medications, we place that stereotactic frame that will actually lock to the table itself so the patient doesn't move and we wouldn't have to start from square one. We also place a Foley catheter. Um, uh, we don't want to have to worry about a patient needing to get up to use the restroom. So if we can drain the bladder, we're a lot more likely to be able to keep them flat throughout the, the duration of the treatment and get success. Um, and then we pull that silicone membrane over the scalp that I mentioned. That provides a seal for the water bath, which helps keep the head cool, but also helps uh, eliminate any water, or excuse me, any air inside the water so that we can converge those beams appropriately. Uh, Dr. Rolson showed this slide. This is what it looks like. Um, you probably recognize the MRI, this donut in the back. And then this is the table that the patient goes on. And this is the stereotactic head frame. And then this bowl here is what contains those 1,024 ultrasound probes and contains the water and is used to deliver the treatment. So we um, have that uh, stereotactic frame on, the patient lies down on the table in the scanner room. We then obtain a third set of images, some new MRI images that look a little bit different once we have that frame on. And then we fuse those day of treatment images to the preoperative images. And that's when we really start to confirm our target. We then perform some baseline tests. Dr. Rolson showed this. These are some Archime Archimedes spirals. And then we have them connect two lines, write their name. Uh, patients get really embarrassed that they can't do so well, but we actually try to reassure them. The worse they do on this, the easier it makes our job. We're able to, to really pinpoint where we want to be based on these results. The really important uh, technological feature we have is the real-time thermometry that is used with the MRI. We're able to know exactly where the beam is by the um, increase in temperature that we're able to measure in real time as we deliver the ultrasound. This is where I like to give a quick shout out to our research team here at the University of Utah. Um, our colleague and mentor, Dr. Dennis Parker, actually was the first person to publish MR thermometry uh, back in the 1980s. So this is something that's been going on a long time that University of Utah has actually played a, a really key role in. Um, and without that real-time temperature measurement, you know, we wouldn't be able to do this reliably and safely. Um, so the first thing we do is we, we get that um, all lined up and we deliver subtherapeutic doses just to make sure that we're able to properly measure the temperature changes and see where those temperature changes are occurring to make sure that we are targeting appropriately. We then start to escalate um, and we deliver higher doses. Um, and these will be um, therapeutic in a sense, but transient. So more like a neuromodulatory dose. Um, and that is where we start to see a clinical response. So we look to see if the tremor is improving, but also importantly, we look for any of those side effects like weakness or sensation changes or um, ataxias to make sure that we are right on target. At this point, any changes that are observed would not be permanent, so we can move away from the areas that are causing those side effects if we're not precisely on target. This is one of the real benefits of being able to do this awake with MRI guidance. Um, and one of the reasons um, we actually have to do it awake is to be able to target in and know we're precisely delivering right on target. Um, I wanna make sure I'm not missing anything in my text. Uh, yeah, so we're able to, to adjust and, and really hone in properly before we, we really deliver the higher dose. Once we've seen a good response and we've seen the absence of any side effects, then we really hit it harder. And you can see again, this is spot on with our little target here. This tracing down here shows us the measured um, temperature changes. And what we're looking at here is this average. So the average measurement within this little cube where we're delivering the dose, um, we want to hit a target temperature of 55 degrees centigrade, and that will achieve a permanent result. And so we've hit 58 here, which is right where we want to be. Uh, Dr. Rolson showed this again, uh, but I'm, I think it bears repeating. Um, we try to usually hit it two or three times with that permanent dose. To, to really seal the deal and lock in that effect. And then uh, the patient is brought out of the scanner. We take off that head frame. We repeat the imaging. So on the left, this is the preoperative imaging. On the right, we have this uh, concentric circle target sign with that central area, which is going to be what has the permanent ablative response right where we want it to be on the VIM. So 
I can describe it, but I think some pictures are actually really helpful. This is what um, is one of our earlier patients. Uh, this is kind of what a treatment day looks like. They show up around eight o'clock. They're in, in our suite. Uh, we administer all those uh, medications, get them prepped. Uh, we place this frame. So this is the least comfortable part of the day. This is the closest thing we do to an invasive procedure. We have two pins in the front, two in the back, which we provide after, uh, we provide some lidocaine for before putting those in. Uh, in addition to the moderate sedation. We place a Foley catheter again to make sure the bladder gets drained. Um, then we're all good to go. We walk into the scanner room. This is usually done around nine o'clock. That whole prep takes you know 30 to 60 minutes. So usually by nine, we're getting in there. We pull this silicone membrane. You can see this here, um, tight down over the, the margin right where, where that, those frame pins go in and that will trap the water. And then uh, the patient lies down flat. We connect them to the table and the, the device and we start confirming our images. We get another set of those day of MR images to confirm everything. And then here's a picture of some of the confirmatory testing we'll do. So here's baseline. You see Dr. Rolston talking to this patient. Hopefully Zoom allows you to see this. He's got a pretty substantial baseline tremor. Is that video coming across properly? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So, um, you know, we had him demonstrate his tremor and then now we're having him try to draw those Archimedes spirals. Really difficult for this patient. This is what it looked like again at baseline. So after we've delivered one of those smaller doses, this is what it starts to look like. He can actually hold pen to paper, but it's not perfect, but we're, we're on the right target. And he had no sensory changes, no weakness. And so once we were there, we knew that we could really hit it to achieve that permanent result by hitting that target of greater than 55 degrees. Oops. This is the best slide. I don't want to mess it up. So here we are after we've treated. You can see that tremor is essentially gone. So uh, you see, not only can he hold pen to paper, he actually can draw this very nicely. Um, he gave us permission to show his signature. He was so proud of it. Um, a lot of these patients are incredibly disabled. You know, by the time they get in, they won't answer the phone because they can't hold it to their face. Um, this, this gentleman had not been able to really feed himself or drink on his own for a couple of decades. Um, so one thing we like to do at the end is give him a glass of water, just see how that goes. You can see there's still a trace amount of, of tremor left, but it's dramatically better and he's able to do this. He's, he's joking now that if we had tried that before that, he would have soaked the room. So he's, he's very happy. And this, this is really the, the rewarding part at the end, of the, the end of the treatment session when you know, they see that immediate effect and that's what we can expect going forward for them. Um, so here is our, we have a special website set up to get in touch. Um, we're gonna kind of move on to some of the logistics. You can go to uofu.health.org slash ET or call this number 801-585-7575. We'll make sure that this is available. That gets straight to our nurse coordinators that, that run uh, the list for us essentially to help get our patients through the whole workup process. Um, and this is really a collaborative team effort. Um, this isn't even an exhaustive list of the people in the clinical and research teams, but there are a lot of, a lot of people that have gone to making this program possible. Um, so I wanna thank all of them and um, we'll move on to some questions. <clears throat> Thanks, so as we're waiting for the first questions, I'll reiterate, you're, you're welcome to turn on your microphone and talk to us and if you engage in conversation, we can do some questions and answer. You can also use your chat feature there to pose your questions in writing. We'll entertain those as well. Maybe I can start by asking the questions uh, to both John and Matt. That is, John, you showed the published data on the original New England paper. Uh, what would you say about uh, rate of complications that we might have seen here, both both success and complications? Obviously, we have we have a sample that is a little bit different than what was published. 
So, so I think that our um, our tremor improvement rate is much higher than they saw in that original paper. So it's more like um, you know seventy uh, to ninety percent. Many people that are one hundred percent tremor resolved, which is good. Um, so I think that's because we've gotten a little bit more savvy in how um, how quickly to ramp up the heating for the target. I think in the in the original ones they would go really slow and kind of go degree by degree. Now we kind of confirm the the appropriate place and then just immediately go to a higher temperature, which which I think helps with that. Um, we've also done a little bit to help minimize some of the um, uh, the balance issues we've seen by going to a different place in the superior inferior plane than previously done, which I think helps with that too. So I think that our, our balance issues are we still have them um, that, that sort of transient um, you know imbalance and coordination. Um, but I think it's better than it was initially and better as, as a, you know, our whole society is doing better at this. We've never really seen any of the, um, the motor complications in terms of like weakness that other people have reported. Um, and that could be because we um, do a lot of targeting based upon um, the, the actual imaging, looking at things like the third ventricle. Um, and you can, you can also visualize the internal capsule pretty well in some of the imaging we get, like the white matter null MRI sequences. So that seems to be less likely than, than prior other people. But, um, but the, the, the fact is you're still, um, you're creating this uh, essentially a stroke to, to treat tremor. So there will be some, uh, you know, hopefully transient side effects from doing that. Um, and it's another reason that we try to reserve this for people who have this severe disabling tremor. This is not for people that have a little bit of, uh, you know, very mild tremor when they're giving public speaking type things. This is for people that are actually disabled by the that needed. Yeah, I would agree with everything John mentioned. Um, you know, I think we probably have gotten our complication rate lower than was in seen in the clinical trial. Partly just, you know, we've been in communication to try to continue to learn as a field. Um, we haven't gotten it to zero, but it I think is acceptably quite low. Um, and the other the other take home that I've kind of had is the fifty percent threshold. You know, the target for definition of success in the controlled trial is like surprisingly easy to achieve. Uh, if John and I get 50%, we would not consider that like, you know, a really uh, exciting uh, improvement uh, because it's so easy and uh, to reliably and safely achieve a 70, 80, 90% reduction. Um, so that's kind of been a paradigm shift from the, the, the days of the trial as well. I can also maybe add a couple of things and that is, uh, John, you may want to make a comment about this. I don't think we would generally uh, favor this technology over DBS in uh, individuals who are young. And so we've actually treated uh, a population that is uh, quite old in a way, right? Uh, do, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, sure. So I agree with that too. Again, because this is a, an irreversible treatment um, for someone who's younger, so um, uh, as everyone here on the call knows, probably that essential tremor comes in kind of like two peaks. One is a younger peak, either adolescence or like 20s. And then there's an older one, 50s, 60s. Um, so people that have an early onset essential tremor, um, I would, I try to counsel them on going for something that is more adjustable and adaptable over time, um, like deep brain stimulation. Uh, not only can you eventually do both hands, um, which is, is useful, but if there are new technological um, improvements, they'll be able to avail themselves of those improvements. Whereas if you do something like focused ultrasound, that tissue is gone forever. So if there's you know, some new gene therapy that comes up or stem cell therapy, then you can't be a candidate for that. Whereas if there's a new um, you know, closed loop uh, deep brain stimulator that comes up in the next five years, they would be a candidate for that. So, so we tend to um, uh, steer the, the younger patients more towards something like deep brain stimulation because of that adaptability, reversibility, and upgradability over time. Um, for the older patients uh, that are not good candidates for deep brain stimulation, um, those uh, are great for focused ultrasound. Um, these were people that we really didn't have many options for before, but, but now we've treated people up into their 90s. Um, people that we would never consider doing um, DBS on because it's uh, because it requires that incision in the burr hole. Um, this is just so much less invasive and so much gentler on the person that we feel it's a, a little bit easier for them. And that that's the kind that's a a really um, that kind of patient population is very clearly focused ultrasound. So if you're if you're in your 80s, there's no choice. Focused ultrasound would be the way to go. And I'll add one more. I see that there's a question in the chat, but I want to add one more comment, and that is we've made a conscious decision from the very beginning uh, 
to go to put these patients through through a what I would consider pretty thorough evaluation. It's actually the standard uh, that we often use for DBS, but for essential tremor, all patients have a formal evaluation of balance through physical therapy uh, recorded on video. And all patients with tremor, uh, especially because of their age, have a full cognitive evaluation with neuropsychological testing. And so uh, before we get to the decision of whether to pursue surgery, whether that is DBS or focus on the sound, I feel that both for Parkinson's and essential tremor, we generally have a pretty good uh, picture of what's going on. Uh, and uh, there's some variability across the country on what people do with focus ultrasound right now, but and the standards probably will be set at some point in the future. I don't know if you, Matt and, and John, want to say something about that. Uh, I agree. I think that the, the utility of having that um, uh, multidisciplinary group and the, the really good workup just makes it, might make it a little bit longer for the patient, but I think uh, pays off by doing the, the right thing for the patient. Yeah, I would agree. And I think that segues nicely. Um, Dr. Pawar, thank you. We see your question here. Um, you know, this is particularly true for patients in a place like Rock Springs, um, you know, a small town population, but basically for anybody. Um, we're really trying to consolidate to a one-stop shop kind of experience. Um, uh, and I, I wanna introduce Christine Luke, who is on as well. She's our nurse coordinator. Um, basically we have a dedicated hotline, which I'm gonna type in right now, um, where you can call and get this, uh, you know, go straight to Christine and, and she will work on the, uh, the, the, um, the whole process from A to, a to Z. Um, we are doing our best to get them um, consolidated into a single afternoon, a single day uh, type of um, uh, workup. Uh, also, lots of centers outside of the University of Utah are able to do imaging, especially um, the CAT scan, to be able to assess for focus ultrasound candidacy. Christine is really good for, for working out the logistics of that. Um, so for a patient that you know is going to have to come in from Wyoming or any other state, uh, we can try to consolidate into as few trips as possible, ideally one for the preoperative workup and then one for the day of treatment as well. In reference to also the hesitation that pay people have, I do find that uh, we see that here as well, right? So it's a process for patients to figure out what they want to do, what fits with their lifestyle, what their what they expect essentially from their lives. And uh, I think the videos that we've taken here provide a patient's perspective. And so uh, even though obviously the video uh, has only limited value, it does provide the view that uh, we have a hard time providing in clinic perhaps. And that may be something to consider. And if there was a need to speak with individuals who've had the treatment, regardless of what that treatment was, we can certainly help with that through, uh, you know, patients that have been treated here or, or elsewhere for that matter. Can I add on to Dr. Moretti? So we're working on a peer-to-peer, -peer, so those people who have questions and are not um, sure about the treatment, to start doing a peer-to-peer -peer focused group for them that they can reach out to anybody who is willing, who's had a good result and get these patients who are not quite um, understanding the gravity of how well this will work for them or um, just the hesitation to get them talking to people who, who have had good outcomes and give them the um, kind of a global picture from the patient perspective versus just our perspective of education. So um, that is also coming into our program here very soon. And um, we, for the patients who are hesitant or the patients that are, you know, um, are refractory, you can always send them to us and we'll talk to them as, as from the nursing perspective, we'll talk to these patients and educate them from our program perspective um, and from all the, op the opportunities that we have in our program for them, whether it's DBS, focus ultrasound, medical management, um, and really try and give them from our perspective, the best you know, the best education as possible so that they can make that, that decision for themselves, but help also guide them and we build relationships with them. That's the big thing also in our program is building that relationship from the coordination portion that Dr. Alexander was talking about is 
it's just not just coordinating with them, but building a good relationship with these patients so that they feel like every step of the way, there's no, there's no guesswork in it. Okay, thank you. Well, we do have uh, about eight minutes left we can spend together. So there's still time for anybody who wants to ask a question. Um, as, as you prepare for the end of this, this presentation, know that more information will be forthcoming. We will send you, of, of course, the CME information with a, with a reminder to claim that CME today by midnight. Then we'll send you these, these references as, as you're considering your patients and, on how to contact these, these fine providers and, and their clinic and you know, get more information for yourself or your patients. So watch for that. Uh, there, there's a question coming in again from Dr. Bawar. Thank you. Is, is there a follow-up required after focused ultrasound? So, so um, I, I can take this. So the, uh, there, there is follow-up required, um, mostly just to, to make sure that we're monitoring the, the patients, making sure their medications are being adjusted, making sure they're doing well, uh, but it's nowhere near as significant as it would be for um, deep brain stimulation where you need um, you know, multiple surgeries and multiple follow-ups for programming. I, I typically like to see them about a month after the procedure to, to you know, verify that they don't have any problems, make sure the tremor is well-controlled. And then we like to have them see Dr. Moretti run the other movement disorder neurologist about a year um, later on. Some of that can be done um, through Zoom visits. If people are particularly remote, uh, we can do some of the rating scales, but we always prefer to see people in the flesh, but if we can, we can get by that. Um, for deep brain stimulation, it's, you know, the, the serial visits for programming, although uh, there, there are some new ways we can do remote programming for DBS. So that was just FDA approved for one of the manufacturers, um, Abbott St. Jude. So you can actually, um, after you do the initial programming, you can start doing changes uh, remotely, um, you know, from, from hours away, which might also help release some of that travel burden. So things are getting better for, for both um, but we still like to see people, um, you know, at least a couple of times afterward. Okay, thank you. Okay, folks, well, we have reached the bottom of the hour. There's, there's still time for the for questions to roll in if, if you have any, but I want to express thanks to our presenters today, Dr. Paolo Moretti, Dr. John Wilson, Dr. Matt Alexander, uh, these these gentlemen are experts in this field, and we, we've seen the way this works. It's some pretty life changing stuff. We here at the University of Utah Health, we take a, we draw a fine line between what is education, what is you know, promotion and marketing. And this one, we we could tell as soon as we heard about it that it felt like it needed to be out there. That our that the providers in this region needed to understand its availability because this can help our patients. So thank you to the fine providers for making time to prepare and to teach today. Um, watch your email, watch for more information to come on, on these treatments and the education that accompanies them and watch for more on the on CME. Any last words from our providers? Well, just thanks for everyone's attention. And if you need to get a hold of us, uh, we, we put our number up there, but we're always available. I will say, um... One, one thing, we'll have three new movement disorder neurologists join the group in the next couple of months. This will facilitate seeing patients refer to us for these evaluations more promptly. So I would expect that to be an improvement in patient care as well. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, thanks everyone. Thank you for being here. Thanks to our presenters. And we look forward to being in touch with more information. Um, Please subscribe to your education newsletter that will be forthcoming to you as well. So watch your email. Happy Monday. <laughs>